This is a very dramatic image showing the British forces at the foot of Magdala. You see the fortress in flames at the top. From this you will see the nature of the terrain, how the supplies were piled up waiting to accompany the um, expedition. Abyssinia, now known as Ethiopia, it's famous for never having been colonized. Okay, a five-year occupation by Mussolini's Italians in the 30s doesn't count. But did you know that in 1868 it was invaded by the British in a campaign as fearsome and difficult as any the British Empire ever faced? It's a fascinating and little-known Victorian era war. So I asked historian and collector Ian Shapiro to explain a bit more about why it happened. The Emperor of Abyssinia wrote a letter to Queen Victoria in the early 1860s. The letter went unanswered and he got terribly upset. He was seeking to improve diplomatic relations between his country and the United Kingdom. And he was so offended that he took the British consul hostage together with a number of foreign missionaries and he held them atop his mountain fortress at Magdala, where news soon reached the British uh, government that the hostages were being held in very unfavorable circumstances. They were being chained and were not very happy. So an expedition was sent out, primarily to rescue the consul and the missionary hostages. There were diplomatic channels, there were attempt, attempts to release. Uh, the emperor on more than one occasion promised to release the hostages, but eventually the only way to solve the solution was to send an invading army. Invading Ethiopia was an incredibly complicated and difficult expedition, even for the British, who let's not forget were the Americans of their day. Command of the expeditionary force fell to this man, Lieutenant General Sir Robert Napier. He was an interesting choice because he was a sapper by trade and it was the first time an engineer had been put in command of such a large expedition. But he was a battle-hardened tough warrior who had fought in both Sikh wars and the Indian mutiny, getting badly wounded in the process. He assembled a force of 13,000 British and Indian soldiers, 26,000 camp followers and over 40,000 animals. The plan was then to build a fort, lay a railway and march 400 miles through the mountains. Easy, right? It was very challenging. They had spies out who had um, looked at the lay of the land. The Abyssinian terrain, very inhospitable for moving forces and animals. And they established an invading route, bribing tribes along the way to give them support. The elephants were very active. The horses were very active. And there's some marvellous photographs showing the troop movements that were taken by the Royal Engineers. From this you will see the nature of the terrain, how the supplies were piled up waiting to accompany the um, expedition. And they took wide angle photographs showing what lay ahead. Inhospitable, difficult terrain with mountain passes, stony, and they didn't really know what lay ahead, but they knew exactly where to go. And here you see this kind of thing with the encampment um, at a place called Sanaf, at the foot of a mountain pass. So you can imagine just looking at this with the heat and the uniforms and the foraging required and the animals. It was not a simple campaign. By the way, guys, I just want to interrupt really quickly to ask, what do you think to this T-shirt? If you're half the man I think you are, then I know you're going to love it. Well, I've just designed a few different t-shirts and sweaters, etc., that really reflect our shared interest in British military history. I'll be adding more designs over the next few weeks, so check out the links below or scan the QR codes that are currently on the screen. Every sale means an extra two quid or so for me to keep the channel and the podcast running. Okay, guys, sorry for the interruption. Let's get back to the film. So what is it they say? Amateurs think tactics, professionals think logistics. And that was very much the case in this campaign. They established a very, very good telegraph pole system and communications were along that by telegraph, but also they relied on the local troops um, to be fed and watered by the tribesmen who lived along this 400 mile route and they were paid with Marie Theresa Thalers, which went down very well. So there was a huge treasury of these coins that accompanied the invading force. And are they silver coins? They are silver coins and they've all got a date from the 1700s because those are the coins that were familiar and acceptable, although they were minted much later. And railways, I believe there were some railways built as well? Only, only from the start at, at the port to get everything moving, but the terrain was very mountainous 
and there was no railway line all the way down, only for part at the beginning of the, um, of the expedition. The trek to Chudros's capital Magdala took three months, and when the British finally arrived, the Emperor's troops were ready for a scrap. Determined to take the initiative, the Ethiopians attacked on the 10th of April 1868, backed by 30 pieces of artillery. It was a ferocious assault, but they were thrown back with heavy losses. They couldn't match the firepower of the modern British army. Over the next two days, Emperor Chudros did release his European captives, but he still refused to surrender. On the 13th of April, the Redcoats attacked up these steep hills towards the fortress. As they forced their way through the gates, Emperor Chudros, rather than surrender, shot himself. Napier and his men had achieved their objective. They had freed the prisoners and now they burnt down the fortress, they destroyed the guns, they did a bit of looting and then they turned around and went back to the coast. And this is from a music book that you could incorporate images within the page. And here you see the popular image of King Theodore sold to the public as a carte de visite and his young son, Prince Alamayo. And this is probably one of the most evocative things that um, one can have from this campaign. It says it all, where the redcoats are here, the end of the empire is at the top of the mountain fortress and the forces then turned around after Easter Monday, 1868, and went back along the same route, 400 miles back to the Red Sea, and then sailed back to India. And Napier seems to have come away from this with quite a lot of credit. Is that deserved? Did he do a really good job? Well, he achieved his objective, and the objective was precisely that, to release the hostages. The fact that the emperor committed suicide um, was maybe a bonus for them, because they wouldn't have known what to do with him. And they left the country. The objective was not to remain as an occupying power, or to have any political influence over the future of Abyssinia. Because I think most people will be surprised this campaign even happened. I don't think it's one many people are aware of. You think of Abyssinia, you think of the Italians. That's right. What made the British decide that they had no interest in staying? I don't think that they had any natural um, influence in the country. It was a Christian kingdom, uh, very tribal, tribes fighting one against the other. It was not, it was not a natural area for the British to, um, to occupy for strategic reasons or any other. After the war, Napier himself became Baron Napier of Magdala and in 1883 became a field marshal. Not a bad career. In an interesting side note to the campaign, the Emperor actually wished for his son to be looked after by the British and so he was sent back to the UK. I think one of the most poignant items is the page over here which bears the signature of the Crown Prince. He was seven years old when he returned to England with um, Sir Robert Napier, and he was educated here. He was a great favorite of Queen Victoria's. He learned to read and write in this country. He was educated, and there's a signature as a little boy. There's a carte de visite of him in very upper-class Western clothing. And he was looked after by an adventurer called Captain Speedy, and they were photographed by Julia Margaret Cameron, who was one of the leading female photographers at the time. And here you see the little prince and his assistant, together with Captain Speedy, on the Isle of Wight, where he lived with Captain Speedy's parents-in-law. That's a very poignant item. So looking back now, what lessons can we learn from this campaign? If you have a military objective, stick to it, keep it simple. And at the end, once you've achieved it, go home. And I think there are lessons from a military perspective to be learned about that. You invade, you achieve, you return home. And if you choose to occupy, you've got to be jolly careful about what your objectives are. Damn good advice that, both for then and for now.